This is one of the strangest readings in the Bible. I've read a couple of commentaries on it. Um, There are some people who say that this is an occasion in which Jesus in his humanity came to a place where as he grew in a greater knowledge of what it meant for him to be God with us, changed his mind because of this encounter. I've read another commentary which says that Jesus' hard question to the woman didn't imply that she was a dog, but that it was a rabbinical technique, asking an awkward question which you expect the person to complete. So as it were, it was a kind of set-up punchline thing, if that makes any sense. Anyway, there were lots of ways of interpreting this scripture. But the point I want to come back to is the point that Kate Flaherty made earlier about awkward encounters and hard questions. And I just want to share with you some of the conversations I've had lately about what we do here in church on Sunday. And then I want to talk a bit about what these things have made me think about. I've had a number of conversations lately as we've been discerning how we re-inhabit this space on the basis that there is no normal to return to And also as part of that, a number of people have been talking to me about what they think is important about our life in the church. And some of these conversations, well, all of these conversations have been impossible to synthesize simply. I'm getting used to that. So, I mean, even the question about service times, you know, if one was to do a a vote now on service times, one would have a very messy and unsatisfying quasi-democratic result. It's not really how we do things in church. But what's interesting is that there are a range of perspectives about these kinds of questions which are contradictory and impossible to synthesize. But that's also true with our attitude towards Jesus and Christianity and Anglicanism. Just to give you some nuggets, um, I was speaking to someone recently who observed that Uh, this person's peer group, a number of them, many of them, perhaps most of them, had abandoned Sunday morning worship. And this person had come to the conclusion that in fact, maybe the people who had abandoned Sunday morning worship had something to teach us, and that maybe we should learn from them. And I'm parodying here deliberately, a little, uh, but you'd have to speak to the person in question. Uh, One could... I've got the feeling that one of the questions one could ask is actually, why is Sunday morning not really worth doing anymore? (laughs) What can we learn from the people who've sensibly given up on it about how we can meet our spiritual needs in the 21st century in a different way? Now, as I said, I'm I'm parodying to make a point. Uh, You'd have to speak to the person in question, who I will keep anonymous. Uh, But I'm just trying to give you, as it were, a setup for an argument. And it's a good question. If you look around, you know, if you look at the demographic of this room, including the hall, in fact, if you then look at the demographic of people who today are are in bed or in a shopping centre or on a sports field, you might want to say, well, actually, what are we doing wrong? What do we need to learn from normal people who are doing stuff which seems to meet their needs in a different way? Is it simply because we start too early in the morning? (laughs) Probably not. So there's that. There's another conversation I had with someone who told me that though they've been part of a Christian community for a long time, um, they find a lot of what we say about Jesus and the Holy Spirit, a lot of the technical languages of theology, essentially incomprehensible, hard to digest, or devoid of meaning for them. And in this conversation, we were talking about what should be the main thrust of our church life. And uh, this person said that we should teach decency and good behavior on Sunday morning, and that should be our focus. Again, I can't give you the whole conversation, uh, but I'm just giving you a nugget. Uh, To what extent are some of the conventional understandings about Jesus being God and what that has to say to us, things that we should now set aside because they're too mythical or they're out of date, or they're too meaningless, or they're they're couched in technical language like Trinity and Incarnation, which means that we just can't really make sense of them ourselves, let alone talk to other people about them. Equally, I had a lunch with 
a young person who is currently doing an internship in another church. And that lunch was a lunch in which both of us had a really strong sense that this God, who some people find incomprehensible or difficult to relate, was there present with us. And that the living reality of that presence was something which was just part of the life. I I aspire to it, I don't always feel it, but certainly this young person inspired me that some of the more conventional ways of expressing faith are not broken. This is someone who came to uh, a mature Christian faith as uh, an older teenager, so didn't actually come from a church environment, and they discovered something really precious and life-changing in the news that Jesus is God, and their life has now been completely transformed as a result. And I was speaking again to someone who was looking forward to getting back into this building, who has a very high view of the importance of Sunday worship as a place where we come to meet with the risen Jesus. So here are a range of different perspectives about what we do at Holy Cross. Partly about Sunday morning, partly about the whole nature of our community. And I thought, well, where to start with thinking this through? Because there are a lot of perspectives there to work with. So could we have slide one, Gita? Thank you. So we had some sermons on discipleship during lockdown, didn't we? I thought I'd just revisit that briefly at the start here. So in the middle, we have the cross. There's a one on the wall there. That's the name of our church. And then all aspects of life are around. And this is a slide. It comes from a website called Napkin Theology, if you want to look it up. So if I was to say to, you know, a bit of a reminder, a reboot. So what is the traditional understanding of the Christian church about what we're doing here? Well, we're gathered to worship a God. We're gathered to worship a God who we think is real. Actually, more real than we are, in a way. We believe that that God really created the world. These days, we don't think that God created the world, or at least most of the people in this room probably don't think that God created the world as if the first chapter of Genesis was photo reportage. But we still believe that God created the world in and through and under the natural processes that science teaches us about. And that is the doctrine of creation. Then we believe that within that creation, God chooses to reveal God's self to us in a human life. The life of Jesus, born in Nazareth, born in Bethlehem, well, Jesus of Nazareth. Well, there we'll get, there's a whole biblical commentary question we won't get into now. Born, Born in Palestine. 2,000 years ago, lived an obscure life, died about age 33, executed an obscure Palestinian peasant. It's an improbable thing to believe, but it is actually the central core belief of the Christian faith, that that obscure life, which has become the best known life in the history of the world, is actually the life in which God reveals who God is within a human life, God with us, Emmanuel. And that's the doctrine of the incarnation. The word God made flesh. That part of the reason God created this whole creation was actually to enter into it in the form of an obscure Galilean peasant. It's a scandalous belief, actually, but I happen to believe it's true. It is a core belief of the church. And the church has always acknowledged it was scandalous, actually. Then we move on. What was this life all about? Well, Christians believe, the church has always taught, that the life of Jesus, his death, the manner of his death on the cross, which characterizes this building, and his physical, historical resurrection, are actual historical events, and that through these events, God has actually saved us from the power of evil. God knows we don't need to prove that evil exists, do we? I think that's one thing that pretty much everyone on earth can acknowledge. But this is the doctrine of salvation, that we have actually been saved from evil by Jesus. And then we have the doctrine of the Holy Spirit and the church, which are very closely aligned in practice, that God in person comes 
and dwells in our hearts as close to us as our own breath because in the scriptures there is no different word for breath and spirit. God within us, the Holy Spirit within us, as close to us, closer to us than our own breath, giving us life, giving us divine energy, transforming our lives here and now, giving us a new community, which is the church, which is a community which is actually sharing in the life of the risen Jesus. And that life is a life that is promised to us beyond anything that life or death can throw at us. The doctrine of redemption and the new creation of eternal life in heaven, but a life that begins now. So that is actually what Christians believe. That is what the church exists to proclaim. A whole bunch of technical doctrines, teachings about the nature of the world and our place within it. And the point about this slide here is that within the life of the church, the church has always taught that the whole of our lives, not just what we do on Sundays for one hour, should be reconfigured in the light of these truths. Can we have the second slide? And of course the point about the church is that therefore the church is not a building, but it's a community of people who express these truths. We are living stones. We also have better rock and asbestos tiles and wooden floors and all the rest in this building. And buildings are important, but the key identity of the church is the people. We are a community of people who are called to take this good news out into the community around us and share it with people. But it's very important to realize that this is one part of the life of the church and not the whole thing in one sense. I'll, I'll explain why. Can we have the next slide? So if our role as a church is actually to be part of the sharing of the good news of Jesus, to build up that good news in ourselves when it seems improbable, to explain it, to understand it, to wrestle with it when we find it difficult, and then to share it, we need at least three aspects of our lives. We need our head, which is the truth bit, if you like, we need our hands, which is the love bit. And then we need our heart, which for me, there's something there about beauty. About the fact that this Christian vision isn't just something intellectual. It is actually something which is attractive. It's about our heart relationship with God and the world through beauty, through attractiveness. And one of the problems that churches often have, in my view is that when they exaggerate the doctrine stuff, they can become a self-important club of people who think they've got everything right. I certainly behave like that sometimes. I know certain churches I've been in which are quite characterized by that kind of attitude. One of the reasons that people find the Christian faith difficult to accept is because they look at the way Christians behave and they don't always see a good and healthy representation of the way that God behaved in saving us in Jesus. Christians can also express themselves in a way which is incomprehensible. Christians can also be inauthentic. If there's a gap between what we say about what God is like and how we actually behave, then it's not surprising if people look at us and say, this is all a bunch of theoretical rubbish because you don't even believe it enough to do it yourselves. And there's a thing particularly about Anglicanism as well. There are churches which have often defined themselves with a set of doctrines. You need to sign on the dotted line. You need to have a doctrinal basis, a confession of faith, which you teach. And so if you sign this, you're in. If you don't, you're out. Now, for all sorts of reasons, the Anglican church the Anglican tradition has never had precisely that approach. We've had much more of an approach of being a church on the ground in a community. We gather for pray that, to pray and to worship. That has always defined us. But Anglicanism has always been much more comfortable with fuzzy edges, with communities of people who gather for all sorts of different reasons, who are on different kinds of journeys, who are part of their incarnate communities 
who get involved for all sorts of reasons. And for me, one of the distinctive reasons God wants Anglicanism to exist is precisely because we have those fuzzy edges, which means that we can actually be church in a way which shares good news about Jesus in a more flexible way. Sometimes in, there's a downside to that as well. But there's something really special about the approach of Anglicanism, I think, in bringing together a community which is a very broad coalition of people with different kinds of spiritualities, faith journeys, even attitudes about Jesus. Because we don't seek to put walls around our church, though we do seek to have a very strong focus on Jesus. And so I just want to say a few words about some of the critiques. I'm not saying critiques in a negative way. Critiques can be extremely helpful. Critiques, just like Jesus gave this woman, the Canaanite woman, a critique. Whether it was a, a rhetorical exercise or whether he really needed to change his mind, that's an open question. But critiques understood correctly can be a way for us to learn and assess what we are doing and modify our conduct or modify our rhetoric appropriately. And I'm just going to give three categories here. Or have I got four? I think I've got four categories, actually. So if some of the things that Christians believe are actually rubbish, then we should abandon them. If some of the Christian doctrines that we have are actually nonsense, we should not cling on to them out of some romantic affiliation. Well, we can recategorize them as nice stories. But if some of the core stuff that we've spoken about is actually not true, then we need to change the way we understand and express it. We need to abandon that stuff. Ptolemy taught that the the sun went round the earth. Then Copernicus discovered through scientific methods that the earth went round the sun. And so people then needed to change their understanding of the universe in accordance with the facts. And we can all have discussions about different ways in which we might need to do that as a church. Let's just give one example. After the Royal Commission, we all now need to change our understanding that the church has some privileged status as a community in which people don't do horrible stuff. Okay? Many of us grew up with an understanding that the church was a special protected place where people were nicer than outside. And that is a falsehood which we need to repent of and change. Because we now know it's not true. Maybe we can recover a truth there, but some of the ways in which we thought we could operate need to go because they were wrong. So, that's the first thing. If some of the stuff that Christians believe is rubbish, we should get rid of it. Or perhaps recategorize some of it as helpful myth, but not truth. Okay? And there's a whole range of discussions we can have about that. If some of the things we believe are in fact completely true, but badly expressed in technical language then we need to consider how we change the way we communicate in order to understand and express these things better. Last week, we were plugging some stuff into the sound system to try and get the Zoom room to get decent sound, and the person I was doing it with started talking to me about impedance. Now, I do not know what impedance is. There are people in this room who do know what impedance is. At that point, I did not need a lecture on impedance. I just needed someone to get the sound system to work. Now, if Christians go around talking about Jesus in technical language like impedance in inappropriate contexts, it's not surprising if people think we are talking gibberish. And we can think of doctrines, ways in which people have spoken about things like, I mean, let's take an example, sin. Many people now think we shouldn't use the word sin because Christians have given such a poor understanding of what sin is that we should abandon that word because it's unhelpful. Again, I would say we need to recover it eventually, but there's a lot to be said for that in certain places. When we look at the kinds of ways Christians have just made life really difficult for Jesus, 
by explaining who he is really badly. So there's the second point. If there are doctrines which are true, but we just express them really badly, we need to learn a new way of communicating. And it's an open question. Should I dress up in a holy poncho on Sundays? Some people in this room think it's really important that I should. Some people would say, actually, you would communicate better to our contemporaries if you didn't. So there's an open conversation to be had about that. Here's a third point, though. If some Christian doctrines inherently require learning a technical language, we need to teach that language and those practices well. Let's go back to impedance. If it's important for the rector of this building to understand enough about electricity to not burn the place down, maybe I need to go on a course and learn about electricity. If I want to play test match cricket, if I turn up and I don't understand what a short leg or a silly lid off is, or the offside rule in football, should I say, I'm sorry, but your game is too complicated, you need to change it, make it more simple, so that I can understand it without any effort or any technical vocabulary? Or should I man up and say, no, if I'm going to learn your sport, I need to learn the way you talk. And there is no way of simplifying test match cricket. And actually to do so would destroy the whole beauty of the game. And so maybe there are parts of Christian teaching which require that kind of investment. And maybe just as those of us here, we, we are a very highly educated North Canberra congregation. Have we all turned our minds to understand Christianity in as sophisticated a way as we understand, say, our medical or academic or scientific careers? If not, maybe there's an invitation for us to do that. And then there's a fourth point. If actually the problem is that Christianity gets a bad reputation because of the way Christians don't represent it properly, if we're not actually living out our lives as Christians in a way that is plausible, then maybe that's where we should be doing work. In the discipleship talks, you may remember, I started by saying I'm a ballerina. Now, I can believe I'm a ballerina all you like. But if I don't look like a ballerina, that is going to be implausible to people. And if I want to be taken seriously as a ballerina, then I need to do more dancing practice, don't I? And maybe I need someone to say, Tim, look, mate, you're never going to be a ballerina. Maybe you could learn to tango if you try really hard. Hmm? And so there's something about that authenticity gap, isn't there? Where there's room for a huge amount of practice. And let's forget the head stuff for the moment. If you just look at the hands and the heart, that sector there, there's also room for a huge amount of coalition work with people of good faith who find Christian doctrine completely incomprehensible, who aren't really interested in it, but who resonate with so much of what we are so there's a huge amount of room there, actually, for some really imaginative and creative church life. And this, again, as I said, I think proper Anglicanism, which I would define as, as not some of the bizarre extremes which get into the newspapers, you know, proper Anglicanism is a space where our emphasis, particularly on God with us, on the doctrine of the incarnation, on the nature of parish ministry, on the desire to hold together different things in creative tension. These are all characteristics of 500 years of Anglican spirituality. That spirituality, that church life, has got a huge amount to offer, I believe, particularly in the Australian church context. And I was talking to someone about that just the other day as well. So many of the churches I bump into in Australia seem to tip over into extremes in different ways. I just believe more and more in my short acquaintance with this country, that there's a space for a really healthy, life-giving expression of Christianity, which draws on all of the tradition which we inherit. And Australia is a country where people bring traditions from overseas. They take a new shape, but actually rooting us in those traditions is important and valuable. That's one of the reasons I think wearing these things and then explaining to people why you wear them is precious in this land. Especially if they've got beautiful Australian flowers on them. 
And I use the phrase treasures old and new quite a lot in the church. But again, some of you will have heard in, the, in recent talks, I've, I've used the, the old, um, something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue. Partly to talk about what kind of music we might have in church. But actually not just about music. You know, if we're talking about how we inherit things which are of value to us, we need to express them in a new way. We also need to borrow unashamedly from people outside the Christian church in whom we believe the Holy Spirit is working to bring truth and to work and collaborate with them. And something blue, for me, that is the language of lament. You know, we need to be a space in which people can safely lament, bring their pain, their suffering, bring it to a place where maybe they can allow the presence of God to transform that. And also have blues nights. Okay, I have to be honest about that. But now we have a building which is more flexible. Um, we're going to have a range of different things going on in here. And I think bringing those languages as well, I, and I know I'm not just saying that because one of our younger members is in one of the Canberra's best blues bands. I'm waiting for them to come and do a gig here. But I hope... I mean, I haven't really got a conclusion to this talk, uh, except to say, this is my attempt to tease out some of the things that have been provoking me as I've been talking to people in our community and outside our community about what we're doing here. And I'm not saying any of this to shut down any conversations, I hope. I'm saying this in order to open up conversations, conversations I hope we will have as a community over the months and years to come. Because actually it's in those conversations, the sort of conversation that Jesus had with the woman, that our minds might be changed and we might come to a greater understanding of what we are all doing here. And hopefully an understanding which, just like the conversation Jesus had, opens up our life and our community to new friends and to new opportunities. Amen.